Chapter Twelve of Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. Charles Dickens by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter Twelve: A Note on the Future of Dickens. The hardest thing to remember about our own time, of course, is simply that it is a time. We all instinctively think of it as the day of judgment, but all the things in it which belong to it, merely as this time will probably be rapidly turned upside down, all the things that can pass will pass. It is not merely true that all old things are already dead. It is also true that all things are already dead, for the only undying things are the things that are neither new nor old. The more you are up with the year's fashion, the more, in a sense, you are already behind next year's. Consequently, in attempting to decide whether an author will, as it is cantly expressed, live, it is necessary to have very firm convictions about what part, if any part, of man is unchangeable, and it is very hard to have this if you have not a religion or, at least, a dogmatic philosophy. The equality of men needs preaching quite as much as regards the ages as regards the classes of men. To feel infinitely superior to a man in the twelfth century is just precisely as snobbish as to feel infinitely superior to a man in the old Kent Road. There are differences between the man and us. There may be superiorities in us over the man but our sin in both cases consists in thinking of the small things wherein we differ when we ought to be confounded and intoxicated by the terrible and joyful matters in which we are at one. But here again the difficulty always is that the things near us seem larger than they are, and so seem to be a permanent part of mankind when they may really be only one of its party modes of expression. Few people, for instance, realise that a time may easily come when we shall see the great outburst of science in the nineteenth century as something quite as splendid, brief, unique, and ultimately abandoned, as the outburst of art at the Renaissance. Few people realise that the general habit of fiction, of telling tales in prose, may fade, like the general habit of the ballad, of telling tales in verse, has for the time faded. Few people realise that reading and writing are only arbitrary, and perhaps temporary sciences, like heraldry. The immortal mind will remain, and by that writers like Dickens will be securely judged. That Dickens will have a high place in permanent literature there is, I imagine, no prig surviving to deny. But though all prediction is in the dark, I would devote this chapter to suggesting that his place in nineteenth-century England will not only be high, but altogether the highest. At a certain period of his contemporary fame, an average Englishman would have said that there were, at that moment in England, about five or six able and equal novelists. He could have made a list. Dickens, Bulwer Lytton, Thackeray, Charlotte Bronte, George Eliot, perhaps more. Forty years or more have passed and some of them have slipped to a lower place. Some would now say that the highest platform is left to Thackeray and Dickens. Some to Dickens, Thackeray and George Eliot. Some to Dickens, Thackeray and Charlotte Bronte. I venture to offer the proposition 
that when more years have passed, and more weeding has been effected, Dickens will dominate the whole England of the nineteenth century. He will be left on that platform alone. I know that this is an almost impertinent thing to assert, and that its tendency is to bring in those disparaging discussions of other writers in which Mr. Swinburne brilliantly embroiled himself in his suggestive study of Dickens. But my disparagement of the other English novelists is wholly relative and not in the least positive. It is certain that men will always return to such a writer as Thackeray, with his rich emotional autumn, his feeling that life is a sad but sacred retrospect, in which at least we should forget nothing. It is not likely that wise men will forget him. So, for instance, wise and scholarly men do from time to time return to the lyrists of French Renaissance, to the delicate poignancy of Duvalle, so they will go back to Thackeray. But I mean that Dickens will bestride and dominate our time, as the vast figure of Rebellus dominates Duvalle, dominates the Renaissance and the world. Let me put a negative reason first, the particular thing for which Dickens is condemned, and justly condemned, by his critics, are precisely those things which have never prevented a man from being immortal. The chief of them is the unquestionable fact that he wrote an enormous amount of bad work. This does lead to a man being put below his place in his own time, it does not affect his permanent place, to all appearance at all. Shakespeare, for instance, and Wordsworth wrote not only an enormous amount of bad work, but an enormous amount of enormously bad work. Humanity edits such writers' works for them. Virgil was mistaken in cutting out his inferior lines. We would have undertaken the job. Moreover, in the particular case of Dickens, there are special reasons for regarding his bad work, as I have previously suggested, under a kind of general ambition that had nothing to do with his special genius, an ambition to be a public provider of everything, a warehouse of all human emotions. He held a kind of literary day of judgment, he distributed bad characters as punishments, and good characters as rewards. My meaning can be best conveyed by one instance out of many, the character of the kind old Jew in Our Mutual Friend, a needless and unconvincing character, was actually introduced because some Jewish correspondent complains that the bad old Jew in Oliver Twist conveyed the suggestion that all Jews were bad. The principle is so light-headedly absurd that it is hard to imagine any literary man submitting to it for an instant. If ever he invented a bad auctioneer, he must immediately balance him with a good auctioneer. If he should have conceived an unkind philanthropist, he must, on the spot, with whatever natural agony and toil, imagine a kind philanthropist. The complaint is frantic, yet Dickens, who tore people in pieces for much fairer complaints, like this complaint of his Jewish correspondent. It pleased him to be mistaken for a public arbiter. It pleased him to be asked, in a double sense, to judge Israel. All this is so much another thing, a non-literary vanity, and there is much less difficulty than usual in separating it from his serious genius, and by his serious genius, I need hardly say, I mean his comic genius. Such irrelevant ambitions as this are easily passed over, 
like the sonnets of great statesmen. We feel that such things can be set aside, as the ignorant experiments of men otherwise great, like the politics of Professor Tyndall, or the philosophy of Professor Haeckel. Hence, I think, posterity will not care that Dickens has done bad work, but will know that he has done good. Again, the other chief accusation against Dickens was that his characters and their actions were exaggerated and impossible. But this only meant that they were exaggerated and impossible as compared with the modern world and with certain writers, like Thackeray or Trollope, who were making a very exact copy of the manners of the modern world. Some people, oddly enough, have suggested that Dickens has suffered, or will suffer, from the change of manners. Surely this is irrational. It is not the creators of the impossible who will suffer from the process of time. Mr. Bunsby can never be any more impossible than he was when Dickens made him. The writers who will obviously suffer from time will be the careful and realistic writers, the writers who have observed every detail of the fashion of this world which passeth away. It is surely obvious that there is nothing so fragile as a fact, that a fact flies away quicker than a fancy. A fancy will endure for two thousand years. For instance, we all have fancy for an entirely fearless man, a hero, and the Achilles of Homer still remains. But exactly the thing we do not know about Achilles is how far he was possible. The realistic narrators of the time are all forgotten, thank God. So we cannot tell whether Homer slightly exaggerated or wildly exaggerated or did not exaggerate at all. The personal activity of a mercenarian, captain in battle, for the fancy has survived the facts. So the fancy of Podsnap may survive the facts of English commerce, and no one will know whether Podsnap was possible, but only know that he is desirable, like Achilles. The positive argument for the permanence of Dickens comes back to the thing that can only be stated and cannot be discussed, creation. He made things which nobody else could possibly make. He made Dick Swiveller in a very different sense from that in which Thackeray made Colonel Newcomb. Thackeray's creation was observation. Dickens was poetry, and is therefore permanent. But there is one other test that can be added. The immortal writer, I conceive, is commonly he who does something universal in a special manner. I mean that he does something interesting to all men in a way in which only one man or one land can do. Other men in that land who do only what other men in other lands are doing as well tend to have a great reputation in their day and to sink slowly into a second or third or a fourth place. A parallel from war will make the point clear. I cannot think that any one will doubt that, although Wellington and Nelson were always bracketed. Nelson will steadily become more important and Wellington less. For the fame of Wellington rests upon the fact that he was a good soldier in the service of England, exactly as twenty similar men were good soldiers in the service of Austria or Prussia or France. But Nelson is the symbol of a special mode of attack, which is at once universal and yet especially English, the sea. Now Dickens is at once as universal as the sea and as English as Nelson. Thackeray and George Eliot and the other great figures of that great England were comparable to Wellington in this, that the kind of thing they were doing 
realism, the acute study of intellectual things, numerous men in France, Germany, and Italy were doing as well or better than they. But Dickens was really doing something universal, yet something that no one but an Englishman could do. This is attested by the fact that he and Byron are the men who, like pinnacles, strike the eye of the continent. The points would take long to study, yet they may take only a moment to indicate. No one but an Englishman could have filled his books at once with a furious caricature, and with a positively furious kindness. In more central countries, full of cruel memories of political change, caricature is always inhumane. No one but an Englishman could have described the democracy as consisting of free men, but yet of funny men. In other countries where the democratic issue has been more bitterly fought, it is felt that unless you describe a man as dignified, you are describing him as a slave. This is the only final greatness of a man that he does for all the world what all the world cannot do for itself. Dickens, I believe, did it. The hour of absinthe is over. We shall not be much further troubled with the little artist who found Dickens too sane for their sorrows and too clean for their delights. But we have a long way to travel before we get back to what Dickens meant and the passage is along a rambling English road, a twisting road such as Mr. Pickwick travelled. But this, at least, is part of what he meant, that comradeship and serious joy are not interludes in our travel, but that rather our travels are interludes in comradeship and joy, which through God shall endure for ever. The inn does not point to the road, the road points to the inn, and all roads point at last to an ultimate inn, where we shall meet Dickens and all his characters, and when we drink again it shall be from the great flagons in the tavern at the end of the world. End of chapter 12 End of Charles Dickens by G. K. Chesterton